Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my April 2020 reading wrap-up. So I've just got the one book to talk to you about today, and that is The Ard Lamont Mystery, the real-life story behind the creation of Sherlock Holmes by Daniel Smith. I'm going to read you the short little blurb here, because I think that will help. In 1893, young army officer Cecil Hambra was murdered, unleashing one of the most gripping court cases Victorian Britain had ever known. Even more remarkably, the case brought together two pioneering forensic experts, two men upon whom Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes happened to be based. Their involvement in the Ardlemont mystery reveals how the world's most famous detective came to be. So this is interesting because it's kind of a true crime book, but it does also have all of this Sherlock Holmes stuff, so it's got a bit of both. If you like either Sherlock Holmes or true crime, you're going to enjoy this. There's even some uh, like photos in it, which are really cool because it was obviously, again, 1893, so they're really like, old school photographs and stuff of the key players. Overall, I did enjoy it. I gave it a pretty solid 3.5 out of 5, and again, I would recommend it if you're a Holmes fan and you want to get a bit more of you know, the behind the scenes stuff of how it came about. Alright guys, just the one book to wrap up today and that is A Wild Sheep Chase by Haruki Murakami. There is no way I can explain to you what this book is about, so I'm going to read the blurb because that's the best I can do for you. His life was like his recurring nightmare, a train to nowhere, but an ordinary life is a way of taking an extraordinary turn. Add a girl whose ears are so exquisite that, when uncovered, they improve sex a thousandfold, a runaway friend, a right-wing politico, an ovine-obsessed professor and a manic depressive in a sheep outfit, implicate them in a hunt for a sheep that may or may not be running the world, and the upshot is another singular masterpiece from Japan's finest novelist. So it's sort of magical realism, very surreal, quite humorous as well throughout. Uh, overall, I gave it a pretty solid sort of 3.5 out of 5. It's not Murakami's best, but it was a good read. I would say you're going to enjoy it most if you're into sort of experimental literature and stuff, but yeah, I thought it was pretty cool. Would recommend. Alright guys, I've got another book to add to the wrap-up today, and that is The Stand by Stephen King. So this is a reread for me. I reread it via audiobook. I will say, actually physically reading it was a much more pleasant experience for me, but I did enjoy the audiobook too. Uh, my first read of it, I would have given it a 5 out of 5. It's my favourite Stephen King novel. On this reread, it's probably a 4.25 out of 5, but the enjoyment factor was really harness, uh, really hampered only because it was the audiobook. And by their very nature, I just don't tend to enjoy them as much. It was like a 50-odd hour long audiobook, and it's taken me about six weeks to get through it. And the original book, when I read it, it took me about a week. So there's probably that as well. But overall, yeah, I did enjoy it and would always recommend The Stand. Okay, so just two books to talk to you about today. So the first is Poirot Investigates by Agatha Christie. Didn't realise until after I'd read this. This is actually just book number three in the Poirot series. So obviously, it's very early on. And uh, yeah, it's a collection of short stories. I actually really enjoy Agatha Christie's short stories. If anything, I think she might be better as a short story writer than as a novelist, if I dare say that. Uh, Miss Marple's Final Cases is one of my favourite Agatha Christie books. And I really enjoyed this as well because it's just a great little introduction to Poirot as a character. Nice little cross-section of cases which gives her, you know, room to investigate more ideas. I think in the novels she can go into a certain subject matter, whatever it might be, I don't know, say, the way, um, you know, middle class people look down upon their servants or whatever, and she can go into that theme throughout an entire novel, whereas in the short story collections, she can go into like eight different themes in one book, so they both have a lot to recommend for them. Overall, I did enjoy this, I thought it was funny because Poirot was speaking a lot more French than it seems like he normally does, I gave it 4.25 out of 5 and would, uh, would recommend, in fact, it's actually not a bad little place to start if you're thinking about giving Agatha Christie a go. And then I read How Not To Be A Boy by Robert Webb. So this is a memoir and it kind of covers Robert Webb coming to terms with what it means to be a man and society's um, expectations when it comes to gender and stuff. Robert Webb is one half of Mitchell and Webb who was also in Peep Show. And I never used to like him to be honest. I've always preferred David Mitchell to Robert Webb and I still do. And when I first kind of started watching them, it was watching Peep Show. And I always liked David Mitchell and didn't like Robert Webb that much. And then kind of came up, came round to him, you know. And the same thing kind of happened here with his writing style, where to begin with, I wasn't really on board with it. And it was just a personal preference thing. I knew while reading it that, like, there's nothing, like, wrong with it. There's nothing technically wrong with it. It just wasn't to my taste, you know. And so, uh, but then I did kind of start to get into it a little bit more as time went on, and I do like what he did here. He does a great job of kind of asking the reader questions of themselves as well and getting us to, c to confront our own biases. And just as a celebrity memoir, you know, it's pretty good. It's up there. I'd probably give it like a 3.75 out of 5. 
Alright guys, just the one book to update you on today, and that is Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. I picked a very odd time to read this. Uh, I actually got a friend to pick this out for me. I uh, buy some new books at the start of each month, and uh, you know, I have a list of books that I want to buy, and it's all numbered, so you can choose a random number to choose which one. So I got my friend to choose some, and uh, she chose this one. And obviously I've been looking forward to getting to it for a while, I've heard a lot of people say it's their favourite book. And, um, yeah, I didn't realise it was about the aftermath of a super flu. I did know, know it was post-apocalyptic. People describe it as, like, this band of wandering actors slash minstrels sort of going around in the post-apocalypse, which I guess is kind of true. You also get to see a lot about how the world ended up in this state as well. And there's a lot of, like, jumping backwards and forwards through time, but it works really well. Uh, overall, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was beautifully written, and it was eerily accurate in places where... Um, you know, you had one guy was panic buying, for example, and he panic bought a load of toilet paper. So yeah, overall, did enjoy it. 4.5 out of 5 and would recommend. Alright, one extra book to mention in the wrap-up, and that is Jingo by Terry Pratchett. I read this via audio as a reread for Rereadathon. And it turns out, as I was listening to it, I realised I've reread this a lot more times than I thought I had. I think I must be on about six or seven times by this point. Basically, in this, the Discworld almost goes to war. Ankh Morpork and Clatch find themselves facing off against each other at, like, a kind of parody of the uh, the Lost Isle of At Atlantis that bubbles up from beneath the surface. And Commander Sam Vimes of the Ankh Morpork says he watch finds himself kind of being made redundant from his job and then forming an army regiment of his own with all the watchmen and then marching off to this war to make sure that bad things don't happen. And then meanwhile, you've got, you know, the patrician Lord Vetinari. He's off on a submarine with um, uh, Leonard of Quirm, who is like the Discworld's equivalent of Leonardo da Vinci. So there are some great tie-ins with our world, a lot of great parodies, comic fantasy. Discworld's my favourite. Terry Pratchett is just fantastic as an author. The Watch is my favourite sub-series within the Discworld. And although this isn't my favourite watch book, it was a good one. I gave it like a 4.5 out of 5. Wicked. Alright guys, just the two books to update you on today. The first is Blind Willow Sleeping Woman by Haruki Murakami. This is a collection of his short stories that was picked out by one of my friends for me. I have this like overall master list of books that I want to read. So I got her to pick out a couple of numbers representing two books on the list and then read those. And you know, this was the result. Overall, it was a cracking short story collection and I think it would be a pretty good introduction to Haruki Murakami if you've never read his stuff before. I mean, as with all short story collections, some were better than others, but on the whole, did enjoy it. I gave it a pretty solid 4 out of 5. And then that brings us on to The Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. So I read this as a bedtime book. I read some of Ellison's short stories and really enjoyed them, so I thought I was going to enjoy this. But it was just a bit long and wordy for me and actually I didn't engage with the subject matter too much. So basically, it's it's looking at uh, you know race relations in America in sort of the 50s and 60s and racism and uh, what it means to be a black man and that sort of thing. We actually kind of follow an organisation throughout, which is what made it quite dull for me. Which is a shame because I normally like reading books about organisations, you know. But um, yeah, it was just a little bit overwritten and a bit too lengthy and it kind of diluted the point of it so that by the time I got to the end of it I was so relieved to have finished it that I didn't really want to think about it anymore which is is a shame uh, I would maybe read some more Ellison in the future but I'd not be in any particular rush to all right guys I've got two more books to add to the wrap-up so the first is Eating Animals by Jonathan Safran Furr this is non-fiction looks at factory farming and kind of covers Furr's own personal journey where he comes to term I guess with animal production and whether to eat animal products or not I must admit I'm not the biggest fan of his writing or of him as a person necessarily, but um, there was some great information in this. I actually picked this up back in the day because I was going to use it as research when I was writing my novel set on a factory farm called Meat. And I've only just got round to reading it now and it's a shame because it would have been kind of useful really. But um, yeah, it's worth reading if you're interested in like animal production and stuff. Plus I've got this really cool copy which I'm now going to sell on my eBay store, so you know. And then we have The Long Tail by Chris Anderson. And this is basically another non-fiction book. Uh, this is like a core business slash marketing book. Basically the idea is, is that you have all these like best-selling products that are selling mill millions of copies. But then as you go down the tail, you get to, you know, the hundred thousandth bestseller, the millionth bestseller. And modern companies using the internet now and digital products can make a decent profit from those ones that are selling, you know, only a dozen copies a year or whatever. Uh, so yeah, and it's why like Amazon was able to beat out traditional publishers and stuff. And it, a pretty good read. The only thing I would say is my edition of it. I don't know if there is an updated edition, but uh, I mean it's got here. It's the big idea of 2006. 
and like it's talking about MySpace and Blockbuster and stuff, so it felt kind of outdated. But uh, other than that, yeah, it was, it was pretty good and worth reading. So uh, I finished reading The Robots of Dawn by Isaac Asimov. As you can tell, I've tabbed it out to do a full review. This is in his robot series, uh, but you can read it as a standalone as well as reading the series in order. It's basically like a mixture of science fiction and detective novel. We actually follow a murder, uh, except it's a robot that's been killed. And there's a lot of discussion about what word you can use. Can you even use killed? Can you use murdered? They use roboticide, but that's like the equivalent of homicide. So there is no real equivalent of murder. And uh, what Asimov does really well is he's got his three laws of robotics that he's kind of really well known for. And he kind of experiments with how far those laws can be bent and broken. So. The uh, robot that sort of dies in this, it's suggested that it could be because there's been a conflict between two of the laws that it was unable to process, you know. Overall, I did enjoy it. I gave it a 3.75 out of 5. It's not Asimov's best, and it is a bit of a chunky monkey, but uh, it, it was all right, and uh, I'm glad I read it. All right, I have one book to update you on, and it's gone missing. It's inconvenient. Here it is. So I read Perfect People by Peter James, this is a thriller novel. What I will say is the ending to this totally came out of the blue for me because it turns out like a big chunk, the last whatever, goodness knows how much, this last, yeah, like 30, 40 odd pages at the end are an excerpt of his next book. So it just ended and I was like, oh, okay. Uh, I did kind of like it though. I mean, it's a pretty generic thriller. It's like a combination, it's like as if Dan Brown and, um, I don't know, like, Ruth Ware maybe uh, had a love child, and it, it's all right. I mean, I feel as though as though Peter James is kind of trying to jump on the bandwagon a bit here, but he does actually have a really good writing style for it because he has quite a sparse, quite a simplistic writing style, which doesn't always work, but I think it works well here. It also worked well in his Roy Grace books. To be honest, I would say just read the Roy Grace crime series if you're interested in Peter James because they're kind of better than his standalones, really. But it is, it's all right. I gave it like a 3.5 out of 5, and I'm glad I read it. All right, guys, just the one book to wrap up today, and that is Notes from a Big Country by Bill Bryson. This is non-fiction. Uh, basically, Bryson was born in the US, then lived for a big chunk of his life in the UK, and then went back to the US. And so this is like some newspaper columns he wrote for a British newspaper, where he kind of investigated that cultural shock. Very humorous throughout. I have actually tabbed it out to do a full review as well, so uh, be sure to keep your eyes peeled for that. And yeah, it was just the kind of thing I needed, really, because it's quite light, quite entertaining, and it kind of takes your mind off what's going on in the world. Plus, I've been trying to cut down on my TBR, and so, um, yeah, this is one of the books that I've been putting off for a while, and I don't know why, because I whizzed through it in, like, two days, and it, it brought a lot of smiles to my face. So overall, I would give this a pretty solid four out of five and would recommend. All right, guys, just the one book to wrap up for you today, and that is Transcript by Heimrad Bakker. This is uh, found poetry based on the transcriptions uh, that Nazis created during the Holocaust. It's obviously very moving, very brutal at times, but um, yeah, really good stuff. I actually think I discovered this through Mark Nash. Uh, so, for example, here we have, I turned 12 on June 2nd and I'm still alive for the time being. Again, these are all like, excerpts from real documents. Not suspecting their impending scheduled death, the people clapped and some broke out in jubilant cheering. So yeah, it's really like, it's a heavy old read, but um, I really enjoyed it. I gave it five out of five, um, and it's easily one of my top books of the quarter so far. And probably has a good chance of being number one. This has overtaken Lisa Cantoral's Trash Panda as my top poetry collection of the year. And I uh, definitely would recommend it if you get the chance. Alright guys, just the one book to update you on today, and that is Blood of Elves by Andrzej Szukowski. This is the first novel and the third book in the Witcher series. I'm going to be honest, I was a little bit hesitant going into it because I wasn't sure... Basically, I really enjoy Szukowski's short stories, and I wasn't sure whether he was going to be able to carry it across into a novel because I do find that they sometimes get a bit tedious, and definitely the novel did feel a bit tedious at points. It kind of allows him to... He still investigates a bunch of diff different themes and ideas, but um, he kind of goes into them deeper, but investigates fewer of them than he does in the short stories. And that's kind of why I like the Witcher books, is that um, he looks at like ethics and morality and things like that. And I, I think there's a little bit less of that in here. There is some good stuff on gender, because the uh, Witcher has an apprentice who's a girl, and people are saying, oh no, she can't be a Witcher, she's a girl. And uh, both the Witcher and the girl, to their credit, are both just determined just... It, it, to, to prove people wrong and almost prove like it doesn't matter as well they don't need to prove them wrong just because she's a girl she doesn't have anything more to prove because she's a girl she's you know 
she's a, an apprentice witcher as well so it's like gender doesn't matter you're a witcher or you're not a witcher um anyway all in all it was pretty good i gave it like a 3.5 out of 5 and i will be continuing these books i also tend to find that they stick with me as well so this might be another example where over time like my opinion of this will continue improve to improve but we shall see all right guys just the one book to update you on today and that is the road to little dribbling more notes from a small island by bill bryson so bryson is basically a humorous sort of travel writer and in this book, it's kind of like a sequel to the original Notes from a Small Island, which was, again, a travel writing humour book where he went around the UK. Bryson was born in America, then lived in the UK, went back to America, came back to the UK. And here he goes to all kinds of places. I mean, he was walking along, along Ifley Road in York, uh, which is near to where one of my ex-girlfriends lived. So I used to walk along that all the time. And there's uh, like the Roger Bannister what, what, uh, four minute mile track there and stuff. So it's cool to read about stuff like that. Like he went to Manchester, Liverpool, York. Um, he went to a place called um, Lindhurst, which is in the forest of Dean. I don't know. Anyway, uh, he went to like a bunch of different places that I'd visited and so it was cool to read his descriptions of them. Very humorous. Uh, it took me a little longer to get through it than I was expecting, especially because the print isn't necessarily that big. But yeah, overall, I thought it was a cracking little read. I gave it a solid 4.25 out of 5 and would recommend, especially if you're a Bryson fan. Alright guys, just got a couple of books to update you on today. Funnily enough, they're both by Peter James. So the first is Twilight, which I read as a bedtime book. No sparkly vampires in this one. Uh, this is basically about a woman that gets buried alive because of a doctor who's experimenting with drugs and stuff. It was very unengaging. I didn't like, like it at all, really. So I gave it a 2 out of 5. I only really read it because I'm slowly but surely reading everything that Peter James has ever written. Which brings us on to Faith, which is about um, a plastic surgeon, a dominating plastic surgeon and his wife, who's basically his like walking portfolio. Uh, all the characters in it are kind of horrible, to tell you the truth, but it did engage me a little bit more. I would say it's a pretty generic thriller, really. Uh, I gave it a 3 out of 5. I probably wouldn't recommend either of these books, which is why both mini wrap up bits have been so short and why I've been distracted by peeling a label off. I've got to mention I also read Jailbird by Kurt Vonnegut, so it's kind of a satirical novel. It follows... Um, a character who's kind of implicated along with Nixon during the Watergate hearings. A lot of humour to it. I'm not sure how fictional it is. Some of it definitely isn't. It like ties into like, things like with Sacco and Vanzetti's trial and stuff like that. Uh, overall, I did enjoy it. I thought it was very well written and very humorous. I gave it a 3.75 out of 5. And um, yeah, I'm glad I finally got to it. As you've noticed, I'm running out of books here. So we're, we're down to the stuff that's been on my shelves for a while now. Alright guys, I've got two books to update you on today. The first one is Mortal Coils by Aldous Huxley. So this is five short stories in this beautiful little penguin edition. Actually one of them, the second one, is a play. So we have uh, The Geoconda Smile, Permutations Among the Nightingales, which is the play, The Tillotson Banquet, Green Tunnels, and Nuns at Luncheon. Now I've never read any Huxley before, but I found it super enjoyable. Now, I've read Huxley in the past, but I've only read his non-fiction, so it was kind of cool to read some of his fiction and to discover that he is a really skilled fiction writer as well. Uh, as with any short story collection, there are some that I enjoyed more than others, but uh, as a general rule, I mean, they were all pretty good. Uh, Characterisation was great. I liked the ideas that came across in them as well. I mean, this is a cool little book too. My only complaint would be the, the size of the print, really, but... Um, I mean, I think there's a whole series of these, all done by Aldous Huxley by Penguin as well. And I'm, I'm guessing that the others are going to be just as good. And um, yeah, if you've ever been interested in reading some of uh, Huxley's fiction, then this would be a good place to go. Uh, I gave it a sort of probably 3.75, 4 out of 5. 4 out of 5. And then I read Quest in Paradise by David Attenborough. So this is non-fiction. It's actually bait, uh, split up into two different journeys he took. And I as assume because he had cameras and stuff. There's probably documentaries uh, that tie in with this as well. Basically, in the first half, he's looking for the paradise bird or the bird of paradise. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, and uh, the birds of paradise, that's it, in Papua New Guinea. And uh, then later on, he finds a cargo cult. And cargo cults are basically where um, like settlers arrived and um, native tribes thought that they were gods or that they had communion with gods because they brought all of this cargo with them. And uh, yeah, it was just interesting to read all about that. It was written in about 1960, so the language kind of reflects that period. But it was cool to see a different side of Attenborough as well when he was a younger man, you know. Bit of an adventurer and 
you know, smoking cigarettes with the lads and stuff. It was it was quite good. So yeah, all in all, I gave this like a 3.75 out of 5, and it's a pretty good piece of sort of travel slash biology writing. Um, yeah, definitely, if you like Amber, you'd probably enjoy this. And yeah, that brings us to the end of the month. So those are the books that I read in April 2020. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books, and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.